Well, hello there, person. I've uh, been making some fun stuff here with Raybinder this week, and I want to share it with you. The thing, the big thing this week is these 3D character models. They can be displayed all up close. So far, uh, Wraithbinder's art style has been completely 2D, or not 2D, but 3D pixel art. Basically, voxel art, but with tiny voxels that resemble pixel art. And uh, really trying to go for the style of Songbringer, that, that visual style that Songbringer had. Um, but still making it totally 3D so you can rotate the camera. We can't actually rotate the camera here on the main menu. But um, but now we have these full-on 3D models that can you, you can display a character um, like this. Look at this. Whoa. It's actually really cool to be to finally see these characters up close and huge like this because I can see what's wrong with some of my models and I've gone back and improved the models a little bit. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, so I wouldn't call this completely finished yet, this whole 3D model thing yet, but you can check it out. You can rotate the camera a little bit, rotate your character around. And if I edit my character, you can see a lot of real, what's going on here. Like, um, there's different body types. Here's a sort of, uh, you know, different body weights. Here's a skinny person, uh, female, male, different females and males. Uh, and we've got different heights. You can make him super short. Look at that. Look how short this is. Ah! Which is which is funny enough in uh, in the regular game's view, but when you see it all up huge like this, it's like it looks even funnier. Uh, and then here, check out these colors too. So you can play around with the colors, and uh, I got to work on getting these to be all all similar brightness. Right now, this blue color right here just goes wham. It's super huge and bright compared to the other ones. So we gotta make that a little bit more balanced. And I'm, I'm noticing too, when you see these two characters, this greenish, tealish color, and this this uh, sort of cyan bluish color are very, very similar. So I really gotta work on distinguishing those two. Uh, the, the thing is there's eight different colors that, uh, that can apply to all the different, um, because there's eight different characters, uh, or eight different players in each match. So eight colors that kind of can distinguish each character. Um, so, um, and check out these styles too. If we go and we can play around with the styles. Right now this style thing is just randomizing all the armor bits that you can have. Oh, whoa, his torso, I just noticed his torso has a mix, missing pixel right there. Uh, Cause we're at height five, maximum height. Wait, no, it's happening all these. I must have done something weird yesterday. See that missing pixel? There's a voxel gap right there between his belt and his torso. But anyways, um, so styles, you can see like there's lots of different hairstyles, eye styles, um, helmets, shoulder armor, different weapons. Even if we rotate around to the back, you can see there's an axe, there's a spear, sword, etc. There's different cloaks. So you can have a short cloak, no cloak, a long cloak. There'll be more of these two. The original plan for all this was that, that you'd be able to actually get different items and apply them to your character. Um, or actually buy different items. So you would earn money, some sort of currency by playing matches. And then you go back to your ship and you buy stuff or build stuff with that currency or order it or something, you know. Where you'd be able to buy different shoulder armor and... All that would apply to your character. I'm not sure exactly how that'll work though in the end. And maybe it will work as skins. Like you'll be able to buy different skins and, or pieces of skins and you actually purchase those with real money. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do the whole monetization of uh, Wraithbinder just yet. It's not all set in stone. So there, this is kind of like in a you know exploratory experiment stage right here where we just playing around. Um, and, and this game has really evolved. Um, over over the course of making it, um, at first I really wanted to you know wanted to focus on the online play, but as soon as I started getting this local multiplayer, the game really started changing, and uh, it became really fun to play it in person with my friends and local multiplayer, and I could see that carrying over to online multiplayer really well too. But how that evolved things was basically the abilities, you know, as you as you play Wraithbinder right now as it stands, you go and you earn experience in the match. And that experience allows you to upgrade your abilities. Each, each time you level up, you get a new ability. And that allows you to progress in the match. 
So my original vision was you would make all this progress outside of the match. Like you would earn all these credits and experience and then you would go back to your ship and spend that in credits and experience. And that just did not work. It wasn't as fun for local, right? For for playing it with my my with my nieces and cousins and and friends and um and other people just in person. Um it it just it, it became way more fun to have progress made um right there right in that match right as you're playing you're gaining experience that things are happening and you're getting new abilities and that is just fun it's not as fun long term unless you are playing in some sort of like diablo-esque world where you can go back to a hub world and then make your progress and really it's more focused on the single player than it is the multiplayer uh, and I think that we can kind of combine both of those into Wraithbinders. So eventually the online multiplayer play will, will be able to incorporate some of those ideas, right? Incorporate um, purchasing stuff and, and buying new armor and, and getting different weapons and skins and all that kind of stuff will be really fun um, in the online multiplayer, I think, more than the local. So... Uh, that's the really the big thing for this week is these 3D character models. Uh, the, the there's a few things left I want to do. Um, one is you can see that it's kind of clunky or not clunky but abrupt how a, the character moves from one pixel to, or one voxel to another as it goes. See, there's about three different frames that it's cycling through right here in this idle animation the character has, and. Uh, some of the anim some of the parts of the animation the characters like for example his right arm is moving a whole voxel at a time and that that looks okay in pixel art but when you blow it up to this three-dimensional voxel art it doesn't really look as good because uh what's the word for it? it's just too jitter jit jumpy it just jumps from one position to another too much uh, for this this huge zoomed in view so what I want to do there is is or ex at least experiment with is blending the animations I've got all this stuff blended in in uh, in blender um, so we can take it out take a look at that model in blender um, and uh, th this gets all exported into my own custom format um, for the game and then and then it pieces together different pieces of models so essentially what's going on here is some procedural animation and um, oh, I just couldn't see the idle animation there for a second. That was weird. Uh, so this all gets blended together at run at at well yeah at runtime basically, um, and then cached. So it's not quite runtime. It happens once at runtime, and then the next time you run it, it doesn't happen because it's cached. Uh, but anyways, here's the, there's this animation right. Look how smooth it looks here in Blender. Because it's actually going from this frame to frame thing, but in the, in Wraithbinder's engine right now, it's just all set up for pixel art, so it goes from one position to another in each frame. So I have all this data. All this gets exported. In fact, we can take a look at that little that file format here. Let's take a look at that. Uh, that's going to be an assets cache. Um, I think Plater idle. Uh, no, maybe it's models. Yeah, yeah. Here we go. So this is the format that it gets. It takes all the. I basically have some code that uh, reads a Blender file, thanks to an awesome project I found on GitHub that can read the format of a um, a Blender file, and then it goes through and parses it all into animation. So this is like the animation. This is the tick or the the tick of the frame. So there's 50 different frames here in this animation, and the T stands for translation. So it can translate voxels. It can rotate voxels as well. Or this is in, this is, sorry this is not just voxel this is entire sections of the body for example this is the hips and it's just set to those different translations and then some animations have an R for rotation and then an S is for scale too but scale is currently not used but anyways translation rotation and scale can really um, do pretty much everything I want to do for this whole procedural animation technique so anyways the whole point of what, what I'm saying here is that it'd be nice to blend these animations smoothly inside that that main menu where we're seeing those 3d character animations It'd be super cool to see that so um, that's next on the list uh, and then also working with um, some shaders so I've already got a shader started for it but I really haven't worked on it too much really what the first thing I want to do with the shader is make it look kind of like the how see how the background has a nice dithering going on 
It really makes it give, gives this really nice retro look. And also, you would not believe how much it affects the quality of GIFs. So this makes GIFs export nicely, really, really nicely. I can export a bunch of ping files for all the frames in my game. That's what happens when I do a little screen recording. I can press the, the P button on my keyboard right now, and it would start recording um, each, fr each, each frame of animation as a ping for the whole screen. And uh, that I can convert to a GIF later at the command line. And uh, yeah, with the dithering, it looks really, really good. It, not only did, to me, it looks really good to have this dithering and, and color banding going on a little bit, color banding. Um, it just makes the gifts great too. So, but anyways, applying that to um, these character models could be really interesting to see some dithering going on and some color banding. So just look really uh, visually, aesthetically similar to the rest of the pixel art in the game. So that's next too. Uh, so another big thing this week um, is two game breaking bug fixes uh, and one of them was that players could not attack each other and I've had this bug for a long long time um, well, but basically uh, what happened was it was pretty simple I'll show you the code uh, we go to set team um, basically there's this is kind of a maybe not the best design right here code wise but basically in, we have a player component and a collision component right the player component has all these different player specific things like uh, the players index their crew index their disguise their color index their ability points their experience points the number of kills they have etc but one of the, one important thing here is the team they also have a team variable this tells you what team you're on and then the collision component is uh, um, also has a bunch of bits so the collision component has a category and each of these categories has 32 different bits and check it out all these here's all the bits you can set for your collision category uh, like players skybot boss melee range ground water etc but the more important thing here is we've got team one through eight so not only does a player have uh, a player's team variable in its player component but also has a collision bits for what team it's on and uh, that's kind of important that I guess it is important that it has to be I guess maybe the best way to do this would be to remove the team variable from the player component yeah I'm thinking about this right now but that's probably the best best thing to do here from going forward but I did fix this bug so basically these got out of sync that was the problem was that a player switch teams well you switch teams whenever you die right you die to a certain but it's somebody killing you you become their team so what happened was their team variable on their player component got set but their collision component did not and that was that was causing all sorts of chaos where you would be a player would try and hit another player and they couldn't because their team wasn't the team variables weren't right on the collision categories which get passed on to all of the other kind of entities they create like a sword damage entity for example let's go what is that is it called yeah it's called sword damage right now but see this is a whole different this is a whole entity that gets spawned really for like 0.2 seconds whenever you swing your sword this sword damage entity gets created and it has an attack component and this attack component has a damage mask and the damage mask has gets passed along those different team bits based on your player thing so it, it was creating all these damaging entities with the wrong team bits and they did those team bits didn't line up the mask did not line up to match uh, what was going on to try and you know, was, was trying to hit something and it couldn't so that's why the players couldn't damage each other which this such a huge great bug fix because it really broke the game every time you would get it would take time for this to build up right players would have to die and the bug would happen sometimes so after you're playing a match for like three or four minutes this bug would rear its ugly head and you would be no more fun because not only could you not end the match because you couldn't hurt anyone but you would just be like running around doing nothing trying to hit other players and it didn't quite work and sometimes it seemed like it was working because the uh the uh, automatic parries were still working so when two so uh, melee attacks hit each other they would bounce off each other and it would seem like they're working but it really wasn't so that was a huge bug fix really awesome to have be able to play an entire match and not have that that thing stop the fun so another another big f bug fix um, was a fail safe so now AI the bot has a now a fail safe so basically, the, the way that the bots work, their AI is this behavior tree. This is um, basically a way to create AI that's entirely data-driven. So this is a text file. 
and this is the the AI's behavior tree. It just runs through all these different behaviors and sees which one it can run. And then if it can run that certain behavior, it runs that behavior of that time and chooses to do that instead of anything else. So what happens is sometimes uh, a bot gets stuck in its behavior. It's like, man, I'm in mode 10 um, and uh, I couldn't find any different sequence to run inside mode 10. And so it gets to the bottom of its whole file and it's like, meh, I couldn't do anything. And so I created something that could recognize when that was happening and I called it a failed state. And I could see that was using debugging tools. Um, we can see this a little bit here. I can show you what I'm talking about. Let's go turn on battle mode. And uh, we'll put one other bot. Oh, oh hell. Let's do a whole three bots. Whoa. Oh, we skip menu to shoot. Skip menu. Well, let's turn on this, de this debug display so you can see what, how I found this. Um, so yeah, well, I would watch the B I would watch the AI play, and uh, turn it with the debug view on. Yeah, like this. So um, up in the upper left is my player, is my, the character I'm controlling. I can pick up my sword. There we go. Other three cameras are all bots. So these bots are going to run around and do their thing. And because I'm in this this debug view, it's showing me um, it's showing me what they're thinking. It's showing me all the behaviors they're running. And so you can see that the top right screen right now, she's running path. And now she's attacking with melee. And now she's doing her path again and seek and all these different things. So I will find when uh, whenever it would hit that, that failed state, um, I would make the, AI, the AI's display say failed and I'd be like, okay, they failed and here's why. And I finally found out, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why they would do it, but mostly what's happening in this one attack state. And I thought, you know what, oh, I just need to do this to the AI and I can improve the AI and make it work again. But, the, or each different sub behavior, I could fix each different sub behavior every time this happens. Or I could create a better way and here's the better way. The better way is a complete fail safe. So whenever an AI gets to the point where it cannot run anything, I now have this sequence called failsafe. And I basically just set up something so when um, an AI actually does fail, it gets to that failsafe, it sets a flag in its AI component called fail. And then this sequence failsafe can, with data, it's completely data driven here. Well, not completely, I guess there's this whole flag set in the AI system. But anyways, it's mostly data driven where an AI can respond and say, ah, I've got my fail state, or I got the fail flag. So what I'm gonna do is reset that flag. Here's set flags AI not fail. And then what it does is it sets itself up back to just its pristine state. It gets rid of its vector, any target it had, any path it had, but especially its mode. That's the thing, it was really getting stuck in modes, like mode 10, mode 11, or whatever. It's like, uh, if I'm in mode 10, then I can only do these certain sequences, etc. So putting it back to mode zero really is just, boom, it solves so much. So this is a AI fail safe, right? Fix the problem once, don't fix it again and again and again. That's something I've learned over the years, programming video games, right? What's the best way to solve a problem? Solve it so it never happens again, ever right not solve each individual situation so there you have it some new stuff with wraith binder um and fun to make and in fact this is a kind of a momentous week this week uh the game is officially in it's it's pretty much it's feature complete for its alpha stage right so i've got all the features in wraith binder that i had planned for its alpha version which is awesome so we're pretty much ready to do an alpha test so that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and Wizard Food will catch you later.